Hey everybody, welcome to another edition of the PC Perspective Mailbag. Uh, if you have a question for us, we need your questions. It's a little short on it, so we might have a, a shorter than normal episode this week. Although I do think I say that every week, and then it ends up going for 20, 25 minutes regardless. Uh, leave your question in the comments to this video, and or in the comments section to the post on PCPar.com uh, that uh, has this video on it. So make sure you leave us your questions there so we can toss them out there and, I don't know, we'll talk at them. We'll see what we can do. Let's jump at what we got this week. Fred Flintstone wants to know, why are people benchmarking games with a focus on 1080p? If you own high-end hardware, like a GTX 1080, 8700K, a Ryzen 7, etc., would you not also have a nice 1440p or higher resolution display to go with it? Uh, Fred, that's a great thought, but no, I guess, is, is just the easy answer. You know, the... The truth of the matter is, unfortunately, the majority of people, gamers, PC users, whatever, uh, still think of displays kind of last in their upgrade chain. Uh, you might have gone through three or four or more processor and platform upgrades before you upgrade a display, uh, which I think is, is still often happening, which is why you get tons and tons of people that are still playing games at 1080p. Um, you know, they have a 24-inch or 22-inch display that they've had for a while that they really like, they don't have any problem with, and they don't necessarily know how to see the differences. Um, you know, when, when we go to a, a review of a graphics card, for example, you can tell that one is faster than the other. The bar goes higher or the frame times go lower than the other one. When you look at monitors, you know, we can we can tell you like color spaces and uh, latency times and that type of stuff, but uh, most of that doesn't mean much to anybody because it's it, until you have that thing in front of you, it's just it's just hard to tell. So, um, you know, in general, while I would agree that I think I would wish people who own high-end hardware would all have high resolution displays. The truth is is that they don't. And if you look at stuff like Steam statistics or whatever you it will it will show out that 1080p is still far and away the most important. So when we look at benchmarking, we don't we try not to focus on 1080p, um, especially when focusing on GPU performance, right? Like when you look at our GTX 1080 review, uh, chances are it only has 1440p and 4K results in it. Same thing with our Vega 64, uh, and that's mostly because the the differences that you'll find at 1080p are minimal and or irrelevant, right? Like they run all of these games so fast it doesn't doesn't really matter. Uh, when we look at CPU performance, we put a little bit more emphasis on the 1080p side, um, particularly because that is where we would likely see more performance delta if it exists, right? Which is what happened with Ryzen 7 and Threadripper and all that type of stuff uh, and how those issues were, were found. Um, and it's also, you know, so it's a more relevant CPU benchmark, but then it's also, um, you know, it's, it's, it's just, again, we're kind of catering to where people may or may not be in their display pipeline or in their display hierarchy, what, what purchases they have made most recently. I, I would, I'm all on board for people, I, hell, let's force everybody to upgrade away from 1080p PC games uh, or PC displays because I would like to see games improved in that way. I like to see GPUs um, uh, continue to be important and relevant, and uh, that will definitely help in that. Trust me, nobody wants people to move away from 1080p screens more than NVIDIA and AMD, right? They want to sell those high end graphics cards and other hardware. Uh, Slav John, uh, we'll leave it at that. Since we have a strong inclination to believe that Intel's Ice Lake is going to be released in the second half of 2018, would it be safe to assume that Cannon Lake would therefore be due in the first half of 2018, since Ice Lake is supposed to be a Cannon Lake optimization? Um, yes. The, the, the strong inclination you have that Ice Lake is going to be released in the second half of 2018 is really still that it's just a it's just a rumor to guess as an inclination. Um, there have been plenty of successive rumors talking about Cannon Lake and its release to uh, consumer product lines early in 2018. Much of that discussion centering around, hey, is the Coffee Lake product that we see now kind of a, a mid step, just kind of a stepping stone to Cannon Lake and higher core count parts and better performance parts? And that's all. That all seems pretty likely at this point, based on rumors and everything we see floating around. Um, so I, I, I do think that probably we'll see Cannon Lake in the first half. Um, 
And then if you if we do in fact see Ice Lake in the second half, I mean suddenly we have this incredibly quick cadence of Intel processor releases. I think many would argue that the cadences aren't differentiated enough in terms of performance or feature set or whatever have you. But um, it's hard to argue with faster iteration, more cores, more clock, however they can however they can make it happen. So we'll see if this move to 10 nanometer um, lives up to some of what Intel has been hoping and claiming. Ricardo Pena wants to know, since x86 is owned by Intel and licensed to AMD, will we ever see an AMD CPU that is all around better than the equivalent Intel part? We did see this, actually, uh, with the Athlon, the original Athlon processor and Athlon 64 processors, Thunderbird. Um, those were better than the Intel processors that existed. The, the license that AMD has for x86 is an instruction set license. It's basically that they have the ability um, to replicate the instruction set that Intel creates in their hardware um, so that there's software compatibility across these two platforms. That's essentially all that is, right? There's no um, specifics on how the implementation occurs or what architectural decisions you need to make. So there is absolutely a uh, there has been an instance where AMD has been the better part in terms of IPC. They'd had better instructions per clock. They had better f frequency with Thunderbird as well. Uh, no, I take that back. Th uh, Pentium 4 was running at higher frequencies, but because the IPC was low, the overall performance of the Athlon parts was better. And that was a really interesting time. That was when we saw the highest market share for AMD processors and platforms that we've ever seen. Um, so yeah, we could we could get back to that point. There's nothing in the licensing or legal agreements that they have that they were forced into, to, to be fair by courts, um, that really define anything that would, that would prevent that. Benjamins wants to know uh, about the X399 NVMe RAID testing. I think we I thought we talked about this last week. We're still working on it. We have found performance issues, uh, inconsistencies. Alan's banging away on it. But we're, we're giving AMD the chance to fix it or at least acknowledge that this is a problem that, that we're going to see. Um, and so as I look at my inbox, we did have an email from them today just basically asking for more information about our test setup and all type of stuff. So um, we'll see it soon. I, I would, you know, basically at this point, I would just say don't buy an X399, X399 platform for NVMe RAID until we figure this out, right? If you already have one, then don't worry about it. Just sit on your hands and, and wait a little bit. Uh, if you're deciding between an X399 and an X299, and it's because of NVMe RAID, uh, you don't really have any options because VROC is still not publicly available. Um, it's not, you know, a supported feature by Intel, and the NVMe RAID stuff on uh, Threadripper uh, doesn't look perfect or good or great, any of those descriptors quite yet. D DTK Flex, are there any FreeSync 2 monitors available for sale yet? Yes, there are. Um, Samsung has a couple of displays. We've seen them for sale on Newegg. Uh, in Amazon recently. And also he wants to know, where are all the OLED and HDR displays that were shown off at CES? Uh, yes, welcome to the cycle of product announcements that are take a really long time and wait until the next CES to actually show up. Because that's kind of where we're at at this point. Uh, we saw like this early preview of G-Sync HDR displays. They looked amazing. I wanted them immediately. It's now October 18th as I record this and I still don't have any. We don't have any time frames. Uh, and in fact, in the last month or so, I think we've seen rumors and leaks that these might be pushed back into 2018, which at this point wouldn't surprise me. So, hey, you know, we'll get another showing at, at CES and then uh, we'll get to buy them in January, February. I don't, I don't really know. Um, there was a Dell OLED screen that was for sale or is still going to be for sale. It had like a $3,500 price. It was 4K, 30 inches, I believe. Um, but I have never seen it in person. And uh, we looked right before recording this and it's not available for sale. 
still on Dell's site. So that might be an instance of they made a very, very limited run of them um, or the demand for something that was, you know, 3500 bucks in today's market was really, really low. I don't know. I, I still think you'd probably be able to sell some $30,000 displays to PC, uh, you know, designers and developers and stuff for an OLED screen for sure. Um, as for FreeSync 2, the most surprising thing to me about, you know, those Samsung monitors and stuff, I think we technically have one here from LG. It's not FreeSync 2, I'm being told. It is an HDR display and is FreeSync, but it's not FreeSync 2 certified. The, the most confusing part about the FreeSync 2 side to me is that the Samsung monitors have apparently existed. We don't really have a relationship with them for sampling, um, so they haven't sent us one. But also AMD hasn't really been eager to send us any either, which is kind of shocking to me because uh, if they're real and they work and they look great, it would be a huge advantage to AMD all of a sudden in the display field um, for these to exist. So the fact that AMD hasn't been going out of their way to say, hey, take a look at this monitor for a couple of weeks because you're going to be blown away tells me that um, I'm not going to be blown away when using it. So, uh, But actually, this that question reminds me. I'll, I'll kind of bug them again and try to figure out why they haven't done that and if they will because I want variable refresh HDR display still. Hardware Barbecue wants to know, I am really curious about your office space. Would it be possible to see an office tour video? Um, not yet. Uh, it's kind of just a big room with a bunch of crap everywhere. Um, you know, there's, you know, eight monitors sitting over there. There's a ladder against the wall over there. There's a hundred SATA cables hanging over there. Uh, I, I'm proud of the space. We're not really in a, in a presentable state right now. That being said, I don't think any of you guys particularly care if it's clean or organized or whatever. Although every time I always get comments about this crap behind me about, ugh, cable, uh, clutter and, and stuff. Come on, clean that up guys. And I just say, you, we, when you unplug something every 12 minutes, it becomes very difficult to do proper cable routing and very inefficient to do proper cable routing. So we just decide not to do it. So, and that's on Ken. That's his fault. Uh, let's see. Street Guru says, why does no one know what a bottleneck means for gaming? I, I mean, I think I do. Why would you, or would you agree with the simplification that one GPUs or CPUs bottleneck refresh rate and two GPUs bottleneck resolution? Since you can scale your GPU down to 480p lowest settings for its maximum frame rate, but you can't do much on your CPU uh, to make your CPU faster in the same type of way. Uh, I thought about this question for longer than I thought I would have to, um, and I don't agree with the simplification. CPU's bottlenecking refresh rate, uh, your, your monitor is your bottleneck of refresh rate, like in the end of discussion, right? Like your, your display is your, is your refresh rate bottleneck um, because there's just a hard limit to it. GPU's bottlenecking your resolution, um, I, I, I kind of get what you're trying to say with this, with this total statement because you say if you lower your GPU down to 480p with super low settings, you get maximum frame rate, um, which is true, but you can also... Uh, increase the load on the GPU in other ways than just resolution, you know, image quality effects or what have you. And if you have a super high refresh rate display, like a 240 hertz, 40 hertz display, your GPU might be the, the limiter in that case as well. Um, I, I would say that, you know, in general, CPUs still tend to be less of a bottleneck in games, but CPUs and GPUs are still bottlenecking a render rate, regardless of what you know, your refresh rate is or, or your resolution or whatever, uh, y your your bottlenecks are, are set by render rate. Because if you turn VSync off, then you have no cap to your refresh rate. Um, and you can still, like, take a game like, um, I don't know, I, th this may not be the case, Unreal Tournament 2004 or CSGO, right? I, I think what you're trying to say is that the CPU keeps us from hitting... 8,000 frames per second when we could on the GPU, and instead we only hit like 400 or 500. And that might be the case, I guess, uh, but it's it's really hard to say because at that point you're you're hitting um, GPU driver limits, um, GPU like work dispatch 
limits as well. So, you know, you might say if you overclock your processor and suddenly you can bump CSGO from 450 to 525 megahertz, then you have hit a CPU bottleneck. But I don't think it's a good idea to generalize and say that somehow CPUs are the hard limiter on maximum draw rate and GPUs are, are the end-all be-all in resolution. I would say resolution has very little to do with the CPU, um, but I, I don't think those two things are, are mutually exclusive. So I, feel free to try to readjust that statement if you feel like I have misrepresented it, and uh, we can take a look at it again in a week or two. Mike M. wants to know, what's that outro song? It's catchy. And I have a note from uh, Jim who edits this. It says, it is called Glamour Party, which honestly I feel like every day at this office really is. Uh, it is licensed from Shutterstock's premium beat service, and he has a URL here that I will not read off letter for letter. Um, but it's called Glamour Party, G-L-A-M-O-U-R dash party um, by Mattis Mueller. So there you go. Uh, I imagine that Jim will include a link to that if you just want to download it to your Rio MP3 player and loop it or whatever. You know, I think you could probably do that. And uh, our last little note here on our shorter than normal episode comes from Christian, who says, You could also make a German channel called Ryan Kraut. Just saying. So uh, we've got Ryan Trout as the fishing channel, Ryan Kraut as the German channel. I do not speak German, but I do have like most of the makings of an Oompa Band costume, so I could probably wear that and do it. But I don't know if that's offensive to, to real Germans. So uh, that's it for this week, guys. Thanks for, for hanging out and listening through. If you have a question, you have some comment you want to make or some you want some feedback on something or some ideas or whatever, uh, remember, leave our com leave a comment on the YouTube video here or on the PCPro.com page in the comments section where this video is posted as well. So leave us your questions there. Uh, I'll be back next week. He says, thinking, yes, I will be here next week. So uh, shouldn't be shouldn't be any issues. We'll see you guys next time. Bye. <laughs>